right. um, so there's a share screen there should be a green button kind of at the bottom in the middle there okay um i didn't really like build a powerpoint i just kind of wrote notes down if you want okay. me to like read sure okay so i have like the shoulder girdle so it's like right here it's like a ball socket joint and it can only go is it sagittal on the sagittal plane so it can only like really go up down and <clears throat> the shoulder girdle is a complex of five joints that can be divided into two groups. Three of these joints are true anatomical joints, while two are physiological um, false joints. Within each group, the joints are mechanically linked so that both groups simultaneously contribute to the different movements of the shoulder to variable degrees. In the first group, the scapulohumeral or the glenohumeral joint is a anatomical joint mechanically linked to the physiological subotoid or suprahumeral joint, the second shoulder joint. So that movements in the suprahumeral joint results and movements in the glimahemoral joint. In the second group, the scapula coastal or the scapula thora thoracic joint is the important physiological joint that cannot function without the two anatomical joints in the group. The acral clavicular and sternal clavicular joints, they both join the ends of the clavicle. And specifically the glomerulonal joint is the articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scapula. And that is the ball and socket type of the synovial joint with three rotarier and three translatorier degree of freedom. The glenohumeral joint allows abduction or adduction, abduction, and medial and lateral rotation. And it can also have flexion and extension. And the uh, acro, acromioclavicular joint, that's really hard to say, is the uh, articulation between the acromion, acromion process of the scapula, the lateral of the clavicle. It is a plain type of synovial, of the synovial joint the acromion of the scapula rotates on the acromial end of the clavicle. And the, stern, the sternoclavicular joint is the articulation of the manubrium of the sternum and the first coastal car cartilage with the medial and the end of the clavicle. It is a saddle type and a synovial joint, but functions as a plane joint. The sternal clavicular joint accommodates a wide range of scapular, scapula movements and can be raised to a 60 degree angle. And then, And sometimes there are disorders that are common and usually restricted to snapping the scapula as well. And the suprahumeral joint, which is the subchromial joint, is a physiological joint formed in articulation of the coracromorial process of the scapula. The space is filled mostly by the subacromial and the tendon of the supraspinatus. 
The joint plays a role during complex movements while the arm is fully flexed. At the glenohumeral joint, such as changing a light bulb or painting a ceiling. Um, movements from its neutral positions, the shoulder girl, shoulder girl can be rotated about an imaginary vertical axis at the medial end of the clavicle, the sternoclavical joint. Throughout this movement, the scapula is rotated around the chest, around the chest wall so that it moves 15 centimeters laterally and the glenoid cavity is rotated 40 to 45 degrees in the horizontal plane. When the scapula is moved medially, it lies in a frontal plane. When the glenoid cavity facing directly laterally at this position, the lateral end of the clavicle is rotated posteriorly so that the angle of the acromoclavicular joint opens up slightly. When the scapula is moved laterally, it lies in a sagittal plane. When the glenoid cavity is facing an anterior like type angle, at this position, the lateral end of the clavicle is rotated anteriorly so that the clavicle lines, so that the clavicle lies in a frontal plane instead. While this slightly closes the angle between the clavicle and scapula, it also widens the shoulder. The scapula can be elevated and depressed from the neutral position to a total range of 10 to 12 centimeters. And at its most elevated position, the scapula is always tight so that the glenoid at ca at cavity is facing superiorly. During this tiling, the scapula rotates to a maximum angle of 60 degrees about an axis passing perpendicularly through the bone slightly below the spine. This causes the inferior angle to move 10 to 12 and the lateral angle 5 to 6 centimeters. And there are also common injuries with the shoulder girdle. Shoulder girdle uh, um, it's mostly with tissue injuries, especially if a person plays overhead sports such as tennis, volleyball, baseball, or swimming. And according to Barr's major injury related statistics, shoulder dissociates, dislocations, or sublactions account for 4% of injury in adults ages 20 to 30. And 20% of shoulder injuries are fractures. Damage to the shoulder and adjacent features can fluctuate in severity depending on the person's age, sport, and recurring shoulder dysfunction and many other factors. Some other shoulder injuries are fractures to any shoulder girdle bones, like the clavicle, the ligamentous sprain, such as an AC joint or the GH ligaments rotator also happen. The shoulder girdle pain can be acute or chronic and be due to a number of causes. Inflammation or injury of associated tendons, bone, muscles, nerves, ligaments, and cartilage can all cause pain to the shoulder girdle. Also, past injury, compensation, and stress can result in a compl complicated shoulder pain. And there are, are like about three to four disorders that come with the shoulder girdle. One of them is the wean scapula. Occur different reasons. The two main reasons, palsy of the serratus anterior caused by a lesion of the long thoracic nerve, which is more common or a lesion of spinal accessory nerve causing palsy in the trapezius muscle, these lesions can be caused by major or trauma to the nerve. Surgical procedure complications as well from under use or of the soterius anterior trapezius. The occurrence of this can be unilateral. Both scapulae do, do not have to both be affected. The serratus anterior muscle palsy 
It is caused by a lesion of the thoracic nerve, and this leads to a weakening of the serratus anterior. Most mammals will have all the types of joints from the scapula and carastoid and the clavicle, but in some other mammals, like it's only dogs and horses and they only have the scapula. Burrow girdles are the, what are other names to use as the upper limbs. And then the pelvic girdle is also the lower limb. So some people kind of get that confused just because it can look similar at first glance. And the girdles are the parts of the appendicular skeleton that anchors the appendages to the axial skeleton. In humans, the only true anatomical joints between the shoulder girdle and the axial skeleton are the sternoclavicular joints on each side. Anatomical joint exists between each scapula and the rib cage. Instead, the muscular connection or physiological joint, the two permits great mobility of the shoulder girdle compared to the compact pel pelvic girdle. Because the upper limb is not usually involved in weight bearing, its stability has been specified in exchange for greater mobility, and those species have only have only the scapula, no joint exists between the X. And the only attachment is it being mostly just like muscular. And then I didn't really like have a activity, just kind of like <clears throat> from what I said, there was movements I talked about where we are painting or um, changing a light bulb. So what kind of movement would that plane fall on, I guess? What's the question if again? Are, if we are painting or changing a light bulb, what type of movement would our shoulder girdle fall on? Like what type of movement would it be doing? Elevation. What'd you say? Elevation. Elevation. Yeah, there'll be elevation in there. Attributed to it, if you really want to like go deeper into it. But yeah, mostly it will fall on the sagittal and sometimes it can fall into the frontal plane. And there's always a lot of variable of degrees that fall into place with this joint too. Yeah. And that's about all I really have, I guess. So. Okay. Professor Beekler, where is everyone? <laughs> I, got a, I got a lot of emails that people had things, work and stuff going on, so. Must yeah, be. I've been working all week a lot. So, so I've been trying to. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna my freaking internet's not good again. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Let me know when I cut out, because again, I my I do not know why the internet is not doing so hot here, but um, just want to go over uh, the the joint action, the muscles, the origin insertions for you guys, so you have this information for your lab homework. Okay. Um, so again, essentially, when we're thinking about the scapulothoracic joint, we're looking at the interaction between our um, our thorax and the scapula, or sometimes known as the, the shoulder blade here. Um, the muscles that we'll cover, pec major, or I'm sorry, pec minor, subclavius, serratus anterior, trapezius, um, rhomboid. There's actually a rhomboid major and minor, but I kind of put them into one category, so we'll just say rhomboids in general, and then the levator scapula. Okay. Um, bony landmarks to kind of cover. Again, we talked about these on Friday. But want to make sure we are familiar and comfortable with these bony landmarks. Um, so again, I want you to on your own self palpate your um, scapular spine. So you should be able to reach your hand around your back and feel that kind of diagonal piece coming across. Okay, so if you follow your scapular spine laterally, to the edge, you should be able to find, can you see my mouse, acromion? The yeah. mouse shows up, okay, I didn't know if it did or not. Acromion process, and then um, again, we said from the acromion process, if you kind of move your fingers medially and inferior and kind of push with a little bit of pressure and kind of doesn't feel super comfortable, you should be able to find that coracoid um, process as well. Coracoid actually means uh, beak, um, so like a bird's beak, and so supposedly this coracoid process looks like a bird's beak. Okay. Um, other things to point out on this uh, side of the model, so we're looking at the anterior view here in this picture, um, the glenoid cavity, so this is where we're going to have our interaction with the humerus or um, allows us to create the true shoulder joint, and then also the subscapular fossa here. And fossa just means like a flattened surface. Um, so the subscapular fossa is going to serve as a um, place for the subscapularis muscle to live. And again, we'll talk about that on Wednesday when we do the shoulder joint. Um, let's see what else. We can feel our inferior angle as well. So if you kind of put your hand behind your back, it'll allow your Can you guys hear her? No. Yeah, you cut out. Oh, it's still muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What the hell? How much of it did you hear? Um, like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I like couldn't tell if you were like looking for a slide, and then I went to like your face, and you were like talking, but I couldn't hear anything. So I was like, yeah, I should probably say something. <laughs> so what? So did you find the? Come on. So did you hear me talk about inferior angle? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. So we didn't miss too much. No, yes, yes, no. no? I didn't, I didn't, but maybe I just didn't. Mine cut Subs out before everybody else's. Subscapular fossa, did you hear about that? Yeah, I heard this, yeah, I heard that. Okay, the only thing with the inferior angle is you can put your hand like behind your back and that'll pop your scapula out and you should be able to then feel that edge there. For the inferior angle. That's it. Good? Yep. 
Okay. All right, so now we're looking at that posterior view. Um, a couple of things to point out. Again, we already talked about the spine of the scapula. Um, two other fossas that we have, and again, a fossa is like a flattened surface. Um, you have the supraspinous fossa here, um, and that'll serve as a place for our um, supraspinatus muscle, which again, we'll cover on Wednesday when we talk about the shoulder joint. And then infraspinous fossa will serve as a place for um, both infraspinatus, teres major, and teres minor. So I guess three muscles um, will live kind of in that flattened surface as well. Um, clavicle, again, there's not really much distinguishing characteristics when we look at the difference. Um, in the sides of the clavicle. Um, the acromion side is going to be more lateral in nature. And again, that's going to have an interaction with that acromion process that we found. Um, the easiest way to find this on yourself is to kind of do that shoulder abduction or adduction. And it should kind of pop out. Again, if you find your clavicle and kind of palpate over from there, you should be able to find that acromial end where that interacts. Unless you're super muscular and have like big pecs, then it's harder to find that, okay? Um, again, if same thing, if I follow my clavicle over from there, from this position, I should be able to find the sternal end as well, and that will interact with our sternum here in the, in the medial section. Um, again, this just kind of shows you how to find those different um, bony landmarks. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, yeah so, you, so you will need to be able to identify those. If I give you like a picture of a scapula, you'll need to be able to identify those different bony landmarks. Okay. So again, I said there are six muscles that we'll cover today that are specific to the shoulder girdle. Um, things like the deltoid, for example, is a shoulder joint muscle. I would say that that's super confusing for a lot of people, the difference between the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint because they work um, together in a lot of different functions. Um, and again, we'll kind of compare and contrast the difference between those on Wednesday. Again, this just kind of gives you a general orientation of where some of those muscles are. So um, levator scapula, um, you can see here, it's gonna lie deep in comparison to trapezius. Um, trapezius is named for its shape. So it looks like a trapezoid, I guess. And, um, and that's gonna be the most superficial of these muscles. Um, underneath the trapezius, we'll also find the rhomboid, um, which is gonna be kind of in the medial uh, posterior section. Let's see, I think those are the major ones that we're covering today. Okay, on the front side, again, when we look deep, we can see a pec minor, that'll be one that we'll cover today, and then also serratus anterior, um, which is also a deep muscle. Those will lie deep to both the latissimus dorsi and pec major, which we will cover on Wednesday. Okay. All right, so let's get into origin insertion action for each of these muscles. So um, the first muscle I want us to take a look at is trapezius. Um, again, the most superficial of um, all of our, I guess, posterior muscles here. Um, one thing that's, I guess, challenging with trapezius is notice the, the muscle fibers and how the muscle fibers run. Again, if you watched our um, lecture, like lecture 4B, the muscle fundamentals lecture on Friday or over the weekend or whatever, um, I talked a lot about how the muscle fibers run and how that relates to the action of the muscle, okay? Um, so again, because the fibers run in three different directions, that means that it's allowed to do kind of three different things. Okay, so these upper fibers are going to run kind of diagonally this way. Our middle fibers are going to run kind of straight across. And then the lower fibers are going to run kind of like this way. Um, I think one thing that's important when we think about anatomy and like learning all these muscles and their origin, insertion, and action, that sort of thing, 
if you can get the general idea of where they're located and then be able to look at the fibers and figure out what the action is based on the fiber arrangement, that's way easier than just memorizing a bunch of shit. So again, I would encourage you to kind of really think about fiber arrangement and how that might help you to understand how those movements actually occur, okay? Um, so I have this little band that I like to use to kind of demonstrate some different actions. Um, I, this is gonna be hard to do with us being online because I like to use like a person in real life to do this but I'll use my friend over here, my skeleton friend, um, to kind of show you the differences here. Let's see. Can you see him? And you turn it up a little. You hear me still? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Val or Lindsay, give me some sort of like visual. You're the two that I can see on my screen, so. If okay. you stop hearing me, let me know. Okay. So these upper fibers run like this. Okay. So again, in order for them to do something, I need to shorten this band. This is just like a stretchy band. Okay. So if I'm going to shorten this band, the scapula has no choice but to go up. Okay. So those upper fibers up here are going to be important for elevation. Okay. Based on how their fibers run. Now, if I look at these middle fibers, again, because they're going kind of across, in order for them to have an action, they need to pull the scapula towards the midline. What's that action called? If I pull my scapula in. Adduction. Yep, adduction. Okay, so the middle fibers are gonna be important for adduction. Okay, and then lastly, those lower fibers, are running kind of diagonally this way. So in order for them to have an action, they need to pull the scapula down, okay? And that's called, Depression. what action? Depression. Depression, very good, yep. So again, all of these actions are gonna occur in the frontal plane. Um, and again, um, that, I, I'll show you another visual video of that here once we're done with this little PowerPoint. So um, hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what's going on with those. Levator scapula, this one's nice because it tells you exactly what it does in the name of the muscle. It elevates the scapula. So that's super easy. So if I know the name, I know the action as well. Um, again, when we think about how the fibers must ar be arranged, they need to kind of go straight up and down, which they mostly do here, um, in order for them to have an action. So their origin is on the transverse processes of um, your first couple cervical vertebrae. So again, these little projections on the um, lateral side of the um, vertebrae and then um, onto the medial border of the scapula. Again, this lies deep to the trapezius. So trapezius would be like kind of laying on top of this muscle. Um, serratus anterior, this used to be like a little video and it would like spin around and stuff. I don't know how that works with us being on Zoom though, so I guess it doesn't work. But um, it's kind of like a weird one to explain, but it's like on the anterior portion of your ribs on the medial side and then it's going to go like underneath your scapula. So again, from the front here, it's gonna be, have its origin kind of here on the medial side. And then it's go, gonna go underneath the scapula. So it's gonna have its insertion on the anterior portion of the scapula. So if I could put my hand in between my scapula and my ribs, that's where um, serratus anterior would then insert. Um, <clears throat> if you've seen people that have like super defined abs, for example, um, you'll see they have like these little ridges on their kind of on the sides here. Um, that's serratus anterior. So you can see these on people that have like super um, lean midsections. We can see the serratus anterior. Um, serratus means feather-like. So the um, fiber arrangement, it looks like there's kind of like feathers um, that are going to attach on each of those uh, ribs. 
So again, um, hard for me to show you here, but I will show you um, when we get to the video portion here at the end, um, that they're going to allow the scapula to be kind of pulled apart. Okay, so that's gonna help with abduction um, or pulling those scapula away from the midline. Like something like reaching forward like this. How would I like strengthen these then? What would I do to make these muscles stronger? Like if I wanted to get that ripped appearance, what would I do? Do bench press? Sure, could do bench press. Probably a better one than that though, if I wanna really activate my core at the same time. Something like bench press, but would also activate my core. Sit up. No, that's not gonna activate my shoulder girdle. <clears throat> you said it's like the bench press? Yep. How about like some push-ups? Push-ups are gonna activate the same action as bench press, but you also have to stabilize your core in order to do so. Um, so again, you'd be more likely to activate these in that scenario because you have to maintain that stable position um, in order to not die, I guess. <laughs> All right, pec minor. Um, again, you can see here that we've got some muscles cut away that we're lying on top of um, pec minor. So it is a deep, deeper muscle. Um, its origin is the anterior surface of ribs three through five, and then its insertion is on that uh, coronoid process of the scapula, actions, depression, and, and abduction. So again, when we think about bench press, for example, or a push-up, okay, again, what's my shoulder joint action? Abduction. A dreamy date, a bad date. Adduction. There's another word that goes before. Horizontal. Horizontal adduction, horizontal abduction. Okay. So that's what's going on at the shoulder joint. Okay. At the scapulothoracic, think of that joint as like a way to get like an extra inch or so. Okay, so again, if I need to, to reach forward for something, I can pull those scapula apart and that's gonna allow me to get a little bit further in the front. Same thing if I wanna reach something off a shelf. I can get some shoulder action, but if I wanna get a little bit more, I wanna get another inch, I can have upward rotation of my scapulothoracic joint as well. So the nice thing with this joint is it gives us a little bit more freedom to do um, have a little bit more range of motion with those particular activities, okay? So again, when I do a push-up or bench press, if I wanted to get a little bit further, I can kind of pull my scapula apart, and that's what abduction is of those scapulothoracic joint, okay? So that's why pec minor helps us when um, doing bench press or you know push up something like that, um, not because it's actually doing this motion, but because it's stabilizing the scapula so that you can continue to do that motion um, through the action of abduction primarily. Um, subclavius, this one's kind of stupid. It doesn't really do anything. Um, it lies underneath of the scapula, or I'm sorry, it lies underneath of the clavicle, and it's basically just going to help to stabilize the joints here. Okay, so its job is to help keep the um, clavicle stable against the sternum. Um, has anybody ever can't hear you? We, we can't hear you right we now. We can't hear you. We can't hear you right now. Now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Foosh, falling on outstretched arm. Anybody? Heard of it? Uh -uh. 
Lindsay, this is right up your alley as an OT. This would be an injury that you deal with. Like, so basically like if I'm an old person and I'm going to fall down, I'm going to put my arm out in order to brace myself as I fall. So when I fall on my hand, for example, the stress of that is going to then um, come up and have an effect on this joint a lot of times. So the result from me falling on the ground is dislocation of this particular joint. And that can um, be problematic. So people in a sling, that's usually what's going on. They had some sort of issue here. Um, with that particular joint. But again, somebody who is an OT would probably work with that particular type of injury. Maybe a PT, but probably more likely OT because um, they're going to work with some upper extremity things. But um, again, so there's lots of different, I guess, things that can happen in that particular scenario, but one of them would be dislocation of this area. So this guy's job is to help keep things stable in that particular area. Otherwise, it doesn't really do much. All right, rhomboids. Again, I said there's actually a rhomboid um, minor and major. However, we're just kind of lumping them into one here. Um, notice that the fibers are running diagonally. So that tells us that they can do two different things. They can do adduction or pulling those shoulder blades together. Okay. Or they can do some elevation. So pulling that scapula kind of up. Um, they can also do downward rotation. So again, if you watch my mouse here, think about this inferior angle here. Um, when I do downward rotation, I need to kind of pull that scapula down. So, okay. So this portion here is going to slide over this way when I do downward rotation. So that's right up the alley of rhomboids. Okay. Um, notice that they are attaching to spinous processes. So again, that's kind of that most medial um, projection off of the vertebrae. We said with levator scapula, it was going to have an origin on the transverse processes, which are a little more lateral, okay? Um, and again, this is gonna lie deep or underneath of trapezius. So trapezius would lie on top of this. What's an exercise I could do in the weight room to strengthen my rhomboids? What can I do to, to activate adduction or retraction? Would bent over row, would that work? Yep, bent over row would be perfect. Bent over row would definitely activate this. Because again, if you think about the action of that, one of the things I want to think about is kind of squeezing my shoulder blade as I come back each time. Okay. Okay. So um, again, that'll you can go back through those, back through the recording to get those um, origin insertion and actions if you want to, or um, you can certainly use the Muscle Premium app or, you know, whatever. So let's see, I want to see if I can show you some videos here on Muscle Premium. I had some pulled up. Okay. You can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so if I click on, click on scapular elevation, again, um, the thing that I like is you can see those upper fibers are kind of shortening as I elevate myself, okay? I can also um, look over here and see levator scapula is underneath, and levator scapula is also helping with this. I can take trapezius away so that you can see underneath you've got levator scapula and rhomboids both assisting in this process. Okay, so three muscles involved in elevation would include um, trapezius, levator scapula, rhomboid. Okay, now
Okay. So again, um, when you click on these actions, it'll only show you the muscles that are used in that particular action. So scapular depression. So you're bringing those shoulder blades back down. Here you can see the lower fibers of the trapezius. Okay, again, I can click on trapezius here to kind of highlight it. I can also then click on this little book thing and it'll tell you the origin insertion action as well. Okay, I can also um, come over to the anterior side and see that pec minor, what he's doing, he's involved. And then um, I did want to show you serratus anterior because this one's kind of a harder muscle to see. So again, serratus anterior here, you can see the origins on that medial surface of the ribs. And then it kind of like wraps underneath of the scapula and is going to have its insertion um, then on that anterior side of the scapula. So there you can kind of see it kind of wrapping underneath, if that makes sense. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna move you guys so I can see this last one. And then a deduction, let's take a look at that. Okay, so again, squeezing my shoulder blades together. Those middle fibers of the trapezius are gonna be important here. Let's see if I can get a, I don't like that view as much. I can get rid of trapezius and see that rhomboids are pretty important in this process as well. Questions on those joint actions? Okay, so I do want to take a look at the homework because um, there are some different things in there this time. Well, it'd help if I spelled it right. Here we go. Okay, you can see my Word document. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so again, just make sure you're familiar with these bony landmarks. We went over all of those. Um, this chart should be easily filled in via either that PowerPoint or you can use that muscle premium app to be able to do that. Okay. Um, this part is a little bit more challenging. Again, plane of motion for everything in scapulothoracic joint is frontal. Okay. Because again, we're just sliding that shoulder girdle or sliding that scapula against the thoracic cage. Okay, um, so major movers. Again, when we think about what's a major mover for a different action, um, I think I mentioned this in that muscle um, lecture, but the major movers are like your biggest muscles. Okay, so when we think about the six muscles that are involved in the shoulder girdle itself, trapezius has got to be a big is a big one okay so that's the largest muscle in this particular area um, so think about that when you're like oh i don't know for sure what's a major muscle versus what's just helping out okay so your major muscle will be whatever the biggest muscles are okay now when you think about a strengthening exercise i want you to think about what's the joint action and what could i do either in the weight room or otherwise to help strengthen that particular action or that particular muscle that I selected as a major mover, okay? Um, so let's do, again, we kind of already talked about adduction and we talked about abduction with the push-ups, okay? Let's go with elevation, let's do this one together. Okay, so the action of elevation, what's the plane of motion? Frontal. Frontal, okay. Um, two muscles that are kind of major, I guess, with this motion. Would be trapezoid. Trapezius, yep. There's one more that's <laughs> smaller. 
would be like the scapular um, muscle. Yep, levator, levator scapula, yep. So again, show me what elevation looks like on yourself. Do the action. Okay, so what's something I could do to strengthen that action, whether in the weight room or otherwise? The fly things, the dumbbell flies. Okay. What else? Shoulder shrug is. Yeah, shoulder shrug. So with the shoulder shrug, I basically just have dumbbells in my hands and I'm just lifting up and back down. Okay. Um, again, I would emphasize when we think about these strengthening exercises, there's like lots, there's tons of different exercises I could do to strengthen this particular movement. That's the thing I love about strength and conditioning is there's lots of ways to get this accomplished, right? Um, so again, I'm just asking you to come up with one. This part is very challenging for people that are not familiar with things to do in the weight room, um, in which case I would encourage you to do a little research and look at some different you know, if I can look at some videos of people doing certain exercises, I should be able to figure out what the joint action is that they're completing and then kind of deduct from there if that exercise would be appropriate. Okay. So that's that section. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, again, origin insertion action or I'm sorry, just origin and insertion of those six muscles um, here. Now, this part is the other part I wanted to go over is this movement analysis, okay? So again, um, if you haven't watched that muscle um, lecture, I would encourage you to do that before trying to do this because in that lecture, we explain like what is an agonist um, and the contraction types and stuff. So I think that that's super important. Um, in, in order to do these without being super confused. Um, again, we're gonna continue to do this movement analysis for every joint for the rest of this class. So don't feel like you have to get it perfect this time. You're gonna have lots of chances to work on this, right? Because this is a little bit conceptually challenging, I think, for a lot of people, okay? So again, when I think about the this is how I would do these okay so bent over row okay if I'm not sure what a bent over row is google it and watch a video okay um, if you already know what it is great so this is what I would do so when I do a bent over row let me move over here a little bit okay you can see me here Okay, so if I do a bent over row, okay, again, there's many joints that are doing things, okay, but what's going on at the shoulder girdle? That's what I'm concerned with in this chart. So what's, what's, what are the actions at the shoulder girdle? Adduction. Adduction and? Abduction. Yep. So if the major action is adduction, I gotta get back to normal, and the way I do that is abduction, okay? So which of those phases is lifting? Where am I lifting? Is it adduction or abduction? Adduction. Yeah. Yep, adduction is my lift phase. So in this box here, my movement is adduction, okay? My lowering phase movement is abduction the opposite, okay? So these two things should always be the opposite of each other. Now the next part's kind of weird, but the way I figure out which muscles are involved or which portion of the contraction is concentric, um, remind me what's the difference between concentric and eccentric contractions? Concentric, you're shortening, you're lengthening. Yep, so the way I figure out which of these things is concentric and which is eccentric is you got to think about what's the hard part of the exercise. Again, if you're not an exerciser, 
just try it and figure it out. You'll be able to find out pretty quickly which part's hard and which part's easier, if that makes sense. So again, when I do this action, which part's hard? Is it the going up or the going down? Going up. Going up is hard, okay? So I, I know this is weird, but like if I had to grunt while doing this exercise, <sighs> that's the hard part, right? So that's how I kind of keep it straight. The hard part is usually the lift phase, but the hard part is always the concentric phase, okay? So, so far we have adduction and abduction. Contraction type then is gonna be concentric because we said that was the hard part, okay? So the hard part is concentric, okay? So if I shorten a muscle, I must also lengthen it, right? So that tells us that this phase is eccentric or lengthening. So I have to get the, whatever muscle I use here, I have to get it back to its original length, okay? So now the only thing I have to do is figure out what muscles are shortening when I do a deduction, okay? Name one or two, give me two. What two muscles do a deduction? Trapezius. Trapezius, yep. Give me one more. Who lies deep to trapezius? Rhomboid. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so again, if I shorten those muscles, trapezius, rhomboid, I must also lengthen them. So this eccentric action is also going to be trapezius and rhomboid. Okay. Questions on that? Again, if that doesn't make sense, we will continue to go over that because that's um, super challenging for a lot of people is getting this whole concentric eccentric thing kind of figured out. All right, questions on this lab? For identifying the landmarks, do you just want us to describe where they are on the skeleton? Um, I think like in real life, I know I keep acting like this isn't real life, but it is real life. I like have you do these in class as a way to, so that I know that you know where they are. So just make sure you're familiar with where they are and know that you could be tested on them. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, if I were you, I would take a couple notes and just kind of explain where each of them is. Again, that's more for you than for me, but mm -hmm. that would be, I think, helpful for you. Okay. Other questions on this? Okay. Um, let's see, let me look at my schedule here. Okay, so today's June 1st. So you have a joint um, audio lecture to watch today. Um, your skeletal system lab is due today at 11.30 via eLearn. And then um, tomorrow you have a quiz on lecture four and lecture five. So those muscle um, lecture videos and then also the joints one that you should watch today. Questions on any of that stuff? or any of the material from those lectures? Everybody's doing okay? All right. Um, I think that's all that I have. I don't have any review things planned today. I wanted to um, kind of focus on those movement analysis things. But um, again, we'll go over those again on Wednesday as well. I think that the more times we can repeat those, the more comfortable you'll feel with doing those. All right. Okay, have a great day. Um, Luis, if you wanna stay on, we can talk about your schedule if you got a minute. I know that was something you wanted to do. Um, can I do it after? I just got a call from uh, Walmart and they want me to like fill stuff out really quick. Yeah, so either call do... Yeah, either call me today or um, we can do it Wednesday. Yeah, all right, thank you. All right, all right guys, have a great day. Let me know if you need anything. Um, otherwise, see you Wednesday. Right. Bye.